How exciting it is to be back in Hyphen's Haven, the space for multi-hyphenate artists who work on stage and off in front of the camera and behind the scenes. We share our paths to becoming who we are. The spotlight for today turns to an Atlanta-based artist who has worked in the entertainment industry for over 25 years. She's been featured in the Wall Street Journal. She's received filmmaking award from the AARP for her caregiving PSA, The Baton, that she wrote and directed. I mean, she is an actress. She produces through her company, Priscilla Bell Productions, she is a proud member of the WGA, and she is just a multi-hyphenate artist who is also a story doctor of all genres, including books, plays, and screenplays. So I am so excited uh, to introduce to you the artist, Capri. Hello, Capri. How are hey. you doing? Hey, girl. <laughs> so good to join that, that you're joining us today. And uh, as we want the audience to get to know who you are, we always start at your foundation. So would you mind sharing uh, the people who loved on you, your parents who raised you, what were their names and their professions and where are you from? I'm from Teaneck, New Jersey, which is 10 minutes outside New York City. So New York in part raised me because I grew up on New York culture, the theater, the museums, the arts festivals, just I was really influenced by the arts growing up because I had a mother who was a patron of the arts. She even took me out of school one day to take me to Picasso exhibit, like took me out of school. So that's the kind of mom I had. So I got to see a lot of great theater and a lot of other things. She is the main influence in terms of being a patron of the arts. And she primarily raised me. Uh, my father was in the house, but he traveled a lot for his work. So he didn't have a hands-on approach in raising me, but he always reminded me how important my education was and what's as supportive as it could be. We had a quite significant age difference. I also had a brother who is actually closer in age. He was only 18 years older than me and he was a musician and uh, in many ways shaped me as an artist as well. And especially because he was an independent artist who actually put out a rap album in the 70s, which people didn't do under their own label. So he was a real uh, visionary. So I would say, and then just being raised by my, my mother's sisters, um, my Aunt Priscilla, who my company is named for, is my dad's sister, and I'm, I was named after her. Our birthdays were four days apart, and she didn't get to dream as big as I did. She only worked as the help in somebody's house. So I thought it was appropriate to name my company after her, because she always told me to keep on keeping on, and that's my motto. Awesome. So with these... Uh family members who loved on you, was there a particular childhood uh, childhood memory that you can recall that you'd like to share? Oh, I mean, I, I remember my mom taking me out of school for to see the Picasso. Um, that, was, uh, that was very uh, significant. I also remember she took me to see a play and there was a guy on stage who was like the MC and I kept talking back to him almost being, not being a heckler, being just, just repeating everything he said. And then finally he said, do you want to come up on stage with me? And I was like, no way. <laughs> and everyone laughed. And I always remember that. I also remember performing my first monologue in third grade at the Black History Play. I played Mary McCobbethoon. And I did that monologue in the assembly. And then I did it that night. And uh, a lifelong love for Mary McCobbethoon ever since. And you know, love for history and all that kind of thing. So that, and then I also like played house in school with my friends in the neighborhood. And I would actually cast them and give them names and tell them the situation. But I also will never forget the day I wanted to play one of those games. And my, my next door neighbor, who's like my best friend in the world, who's also an only child, was like, we're too old to do that. And it just devastated me. And that planted a real seed. And then the TV show Fame and the movie Flashdance were super influential in me being an artist as well. because I wanted to go to the Fame school. I mean, who didn't? Uh, fame was that place. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it influenced so many people. I know that I started looking into places like, how can I get into this type of place? There's nothing like here, but no, not, not in Southwest Georgia. Mm -hmm. I had to just stay where I was. So uh, as you spoke about your uh, elementary days uh, and even your middle school days, we love to give shout outs to teachers. So is there a teacher from your middle or elementary school days that saw something in you and loved on you in a particular way that you'd like to recognize? 
Um, well, I always talk about my seventh grade creative writing teacher, um, Miss Morris, who's now Miss Morris George. And I'm so in touch with her. When I wrote my first play, she gave me an A, but she also wrote, you have a good ear for dialogue. And that always has stuck with me. And even when I didn't even know I wanted to do writing as a career, I was just always taking creative writing, but it wasn't until I was in undergrad where I was in a mandatory playwriting class that I was like, I could do this too. And back then there weren't like the multi hyphen. Issa Rae wasn't, you know, she was in diapers or something. So, you know, there wasn't, there, that didn't, you, I didn't even know Rocky was written by Sylvester Stallone. Like I didn't, I didn't know about the multi hyphenates that had been doing it all along. Since then I've learned, of course, but yeah, that, that was, that was a huge influence. And I have to shout out my mom one more time because I wrote my first poem, Purple Come Alive, and she taped it to her desk at work. And she kept it for years. I still have it. The, the, the actual piece of paper that she had taped to her desk, with all the tape remnants on it and everything. She was my biggest cheerleader. And even though she wasn't an artist herself, I can't say enough about parents who support their kids and their dreams because she thought it was a phase. And when she realized it really wasn't, she supported me. She put me in an acting class in sixth grade. And I've been doing it ever since. Wow. So uh, for your mom to recognize that there is something about my daughter to put her in acting class, sixth grade, you're taking creative writing, seventh grade, you're writing a play. And as you think about how these seeds are being planted in you and you take those seeds and go on to high school, uh, did you see areas where they're starting to sprout or opportunities that you can work more in that arts field in high school? No, I thought I, all, all I thought was I want to be an actor. I, d I didn't think about, I was taking creative writing and liking it, but it was, I never thought of it as a career. It was just, but when I started to think about it, I was like, I've been doing this all along. And then I realized I've been writing these poems um, since my, my father passed when I was 16, which actually was the blueprint for what's my signature work today, my play and now TV pilot, Baby Girl. But that came out of my teenage poems when I was trying to understand what this death meant to me. This person who was close, not, my dad and I weren't close, but he was the closest immediate family member to die. So it definitely affected me. And because I essentially watched the progression of his death during my childhood, because he had a stroke when I was in third grade. Wow. So to, to see your father transition when you're in high school and to write as an outlet to help you understand what was happening with the circumstances. And you mentioned that it wasn't until your undergraduate years in college that you started to really delve more into writing. What college did you attend? Uh, I went to the Mecca, Howard University. <laughs> Howard University. And what did you study? I studied theater. Study theater. Okay, study so theater. while at uh, Howard University, was there um, that teacher, and you mentioned uh, writing in undergrad, uh, was that a particular teacher there that you want to shout out uh, that helped you grow as an artist? Like you're taking your, you're an actor in training and you're starting to write more. Like who is that person that's helping to even nourish those talents? Well, I'll be honest with you, because I didn't want to sit in the box of being an acting major, I got a lot of backlash. Um, but there was a newer teacher that came near my, I think my junior year. She was, she was like 28 and she added, she became, they extended the playwriting to playwriting two and three. And I took those classes and she taught them. So she was very instrumental and also Vera Katz, who's in her eighties, who is a legend and still going today. She always supported everything I did, but my advisor unfortunately did not. And, uh, I had, I had some tough times with my, with my acting curriculum and the way it was received, well, the way I was received as an actor, because people knew I directed, people knew I wrote, and they kind of just, they were like, well, you should change your major. And I was just like, no. So, but now they have a playwriting minor at the same school. Now, we see how long it took. So because multi-hyphenates weren't embraced, and I, I suppose like my mother, I was ahead of my time, I, I didn't get that support, but I always had my mama who even got on a plane, and I think she drove to see me on stage for 30 seconds. I didn't even have a line to say, but that was the only part I was casting on campus. I did a lot of stuff with NBC, but she supported me no matter what. So 
even though I was being told, no, you shouldn't be doing this, or you should be doing that. I, I stuck to my, my heart and, and just pursued it no matter what. But it wasn't easy. I have to say that. It was really, really difficult. So as you are uh, about to graduate from the Mecca, what is pulling you in a particular direction? You, you made a choice to stay in D.C. or you are moving to another city. What's pulling you forward? I left D.C. and I planned to just be in New York. And then I was working on New York Undercover and I discovered the writers for New York Undercover were in L.A. And one of the writers actually told me, you're going to have to move to L.A. And when he told me that, I realized he was right. And although I had pursued theater and acting, the roles weren't there. So I was like, I'm just going to create it. Because then there were examples like Whoopi Goldberg and others. So I was like, you know, John Leguizamo. There were like people, the solo play thing was starting to really take off. And I was seeing that. And I was like, I'll, I'll be like them. That was my plan. So I didn't even tell anybody I acted when I first got to L.A. I just I just told them I was a writer. And then when I did the book, The Artist Way, which has helped me many times in my life, I realized I could do both. And I actually my email was acts right. And I people thought that was my last name because I would put that on Facebook or whatever. So I really embraced the acts right. And then I discovered when I was in L.A., I have a producing mind. I always have. I just didn't think of it like that, because, again, these things were not introduced to me in my coming days. I would hear the word producer, but it meant nothing to me. So when I was teaching in Brooklyn like 20 years ago in a seventh, seventh grade, um, a seventh grade kid said he wanted to be a film producer. I kept bringing in stuff for him to inspire him. And because I was like, how does he know what a film producer is? He's, he's in the quote unquote inner city in a quote unquote bad school. And he had that vision. So I always wonder what happened to him. But I'm, I did what I could to inspire him. So while you're in L.A. and you are developing your writer's muscle and your producer's muscle, do you recall the, the first project that helped you fortify these muscles as a writer or a producer or even actor? Like this is your first. This is a good one in L.A. What was that project? It actually the first time I actually produced, I got a grant in Brooklyn. I, 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 oh. I lived in L.A. twice. And okay. I, I applied for a Brooklyn Arts Council grant and I got the grant. And then I read someone, I think someone had to tell me, you know, you're the producer. And I was like, what? And I realized producing is only putting things together. And I had been doing that you know, a lot of my life. And I, I really loved it. And I loved putting in event, you know, it's like event planning. And uh, that I went forward with that, like, I was like, oh, I am a producer. Like, I really am. Like, it wasn't just this thought in my head. And then when I went back to LA and I finally produced Baby Girl on stage after having many workshops of it, because I never was going to throw it on stage if it wasn't done, then I, then I fished, then I said, okay, Priscilla Bell is going to be a company. This was in 2011, even though I'd been doing stuff before that. But 2011 was officially when Priscilla Bell was founded. And I did seven nights on a seven Tuesdays in a row because it's cheaper to do seven Tuesdays in a row than just get a weekend and you had time in between to get your audience. And the seats would fill up and people would see it. And so if I go to LA today, there are people, I'll be in a room with somebody that's seen Baby Girl or seen The Good Daughter. And it's just really affirming to say, yeah, I have this show. If this person saw it, they could tell you about it. Like I have my, I have my commercial right there in the room with me. So, so really doing Baby Girl was, is the most, major thing I produced. And then I produced my mother's autobiography um, before she passed away um, five years ago. And I produced other things. I produced a comedy show um, because I didn't like the comedy I was seeing. And I wanted to see comedy that wasn't demeaning and degrading. That was just genuinely funny about real life situations that didn't have profanity. So like a kid could come see it. Um, and most of the comedians that I pick are household names right now. Yvonne Orji, Tony Baker, Ida Rodriguez, so and Haley Hall, who's on the lines right now for the Writers Guild strike. So, um, you know, it's I never it was kind of unplanned, but then it was kind of there all along. And sometimes we don't know the gifts we have until we meet a certain person or go to a certain event. I had to go to an event in New York to find out I was an artist. 
and the event was about artivism. I didn't even know what it was. And then I left there. I was like, oh, that's me. You know, so it, you know, I just found my way, but I didn't have a straight course and it wasn't, you know, some people get out of school and they go do this and then that's it. But for me, I've always been in a lot of different places. Uh, I've been called a butterfly. <laughs> I've been called, what well, I've been called, there's another word I can't think of right now. But my best friend called me butterfly for a long time because I'm just kind of go where I feel like going and have had the freedom to do so. But that's because I'm not a mom. That That is a, um, a great thing to be able to go as you please as a mama. I know that that is a real challenge. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember those days. So uh, after you produced Baby Girl, and um, you are interested in now, like the Writers Guild, because you had to make a transition from Baby Girl into this union. Like, was there something that happened that pulled you towards the WGA? Like, I always what- want. I always wanted to be part of the union, um, and I happened to be hired for a project here in Atlanta that gave me the eligibility. Had I done the same project in LA, it wouldn't have happened. There's a little difference between the East and the West. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm just grateful. So I did, I did a project that recently just shot and uh, will be available. It's a web series called Psalm, Single at Home Mom. And even though I'm not a mom, I was able to sell my, my God mom and my play mom uh, skills so I could get in that writer's room. And that was just being that writer's room affirmed I belong in a writer's room. And, and it just, made me really excited. And last year I actually got a lawyer based off my my pilot of Baby Girl because I adapted it into a TV show, one hour dramedy. And uh, had this strike not been going on, I, you know, we might be out with it right now. But you know, it will have its time. We, I'm, I'm glad they're getting all this other stuff straight first. Like that's really important. Could you share what's it like to be in that process of writing with other writers in a room like for the the web series what's that like to have an idea and how are idea do ideas bounced off of each other to write a script what is that process like well the 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 creator came to us with the main characters and then we got to create characters other characters she would just say wow there's going to be this other group of people and we would name them and we kind of vote on names and then someone will talk about, well, I knew this person who did this. I'm like, yeah, that's good. And it's just kind of tag teaming on different ideas. And we have a teenage character in our, in our show. And we have a mother of a teenager. So she wrote that episode. And each of us wrote one episode. It's, it's a five episode. So it was incorporating our personal experience. And like I said, don't, I, though I don't have some of the personal experience, I know drama. And me and the creator were, were drama, came from drama and both playwrights. And the other ones came from sketch comedy. So it was a great marriage of all of us. And only one of us was, only two of us were married and the rest were single. So you had different perspectives and different cultures. So it was really, um, it was really fun. And it just really, and I was also the writer's assistant at the same time. So I was taking notes on what every single person said and then sending the notes next that night. So um, it was I, it was double double information of how it works in a writer's room where ideas are just thrown out. And I'd only had a sample of that at a Writers Guild Festival in 2018 where we did mock writer's rooms. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I need to be in writing. This is my thing. Like I, I love ideas and, and helping people develop stories. And I know that's like a gift. And I, I'd be the person that people would throw out ideas and I could probably put it, put it all together and present it. Like I, that's that, cause everyone has a different role in the writer's room. Some people, the idea people, some people, the, the punchline, some people are good with certain demographics or certain ages or certain backgrounds. So I know when I'm hiring for my show, I'm going to want people that can cover certain aspects of the themes of my show. So it was just very educational experience. And it was only three weeks, but wow, it was three life changing Wow. I mean, that sounds a lot. I mean, because when I think of a writer, I just think of, oh, someone that just writes a script and that's it. But it sounds like there were some more um, services in there to to organize, to even place it in such that you're thinking about the time frame Mm -hmm. of 
how long it, it runs for. Do you uh, uh, think of other services for those who are listening? Like what other things does a writer do than just the generic write a script? What what other well, services? In a, in a writer's room or just in general? In general, like okay. that. It, it's but like a I do want to add in a writer's room, you're bringing your life experience to the table. So usually when you're watching TV, you're seeing stuff based on people's lives, even if it's sci-fi or you know, uh, horror or whatever. Um, so you, if you are like shy about sharing your life, don't get in a writer's room because you have to bring that. That's going to make you more marketable. And then people will say, oh, she's an expert. on." Like for me, I'm an expert on the 80s. I'm expert of hip hop in the 80s. Um, I know what it's like to be an only child. I know what it's like to have older parents. I know what it's like, I know about New York. So these are things because I grew up in these areas and I know about the suburbs because I grew up in the suburbs in New York. So you're bringing your own thing to the table. But being a writer, there's so much involved. The main thing is discipline because it, a script don't write itself. And um, AI is not going to take over. There's a lot of talk about that right now. But you have to mine your life to create fiction or nonfiction. And you mine your experiences. And then you have to figure out what's going to work for you in terms of do you write at night? Do you write in the daytime? Are you going to write five hours a week? Are you going to write on the weekends? Are you going to wake up earlier? Like, where are you going to, you know, when I was in New York, I was writing on the subway. So you have to figure out when, you know, when you're going to do what, because like I said, a script doesn't write itself. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard on a panel, and I've been to numerous panels over the years, is write every day, even if it's just a sentence. And if I don't write something each day, I feel out of sorts. It's just such a part of me. And that's, and, but I, I made that a part of my life in like the late 90s. So if I'm, do, if I've written something like the night before and stayed up, I'll give myself grace, but I, I got to write something every day. It's just, but mo most of the time it might be on Instagram, but I'm writing something. And you just mentioned AI and we are in a writer's strike. So why does this strike exist in your own perspective? Well, because I understand that there, there's the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, right? And these uh, producers, they represent Sony, Universal, Walt Disney Studios, Paramount, Broadcast Television Network, streaming services like Netflix, Amazon TV, and uh, uh, Amazon and Apple TV. So why is there a strike? that seems to be it's between the WGA and uh, Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Why do you think that we're in this strike? We are on the strike because AMPTP is, 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 consists of seven media companies. That's it. And in a nutshell, it's corporate greed. And when the streaming started, Netflix was the first one on board. The, the last negotiations was in 2007, about 15 years ago, if I'm doing my math correct. And Netflix was the only streamer. And nobody knew streaming was going to become what it became. And Netflix started a model that doesn't pay the writers as much as network. And they also did not publish their viewership. But like, for example, we know Stranger Things is a big hit. So if you take writers on Stranger Things, which has been streamed, I don't know, billions of times, and another show that maybe didn't get as much streamers, those writers, both sets of writers are getting paid the same. So that's one problem, as well as the fact that just the residual system, which is what you would get every time something airs, is way off balance. So I saw, for example, there's a writer in Abbott Elementary. So I'm like, yeah, if you're a writer in Abbott Elementary, you're getting those network dollars, you're good. But when it's being streamed on Hulu, for example, they're getting nine cents. They're getting a nine cent check, not nine cents every time it airs. So yeah, so that that's one of the big issues. I also found out that, and a lot of people haven't really talked about that, the um, the late night writers who write for shows five days a week, you know, Amber Ruffin and all the shows like that, they're not getting paid for five days of shows. They're getting like a flat rate or something like that. So I, I heard about that when I first joined the Guild and I was like, oh, that's why the Abin, Amber Ruffin, the Seth Meyers show writers are on the Amber Ruffin show because they're trying to make some more money as well. And then I just know there's also something that has really affected uh, 
people of color, um, where you work as a staff writer, which is the lowest rung of being a writer, repeatedly over and over again. And you could even rise up to another level of being a writer, not a staff writer, like a co-producer, and have to go back down, essentially being demoted, being demoted just to have a job. And your representative says, well, at least you'll have a job. But this is really impacting the writers of color, which are a small, the smallest number of the guilds in the beginning. So people kind of get, you know, they're like, oh, well, there's all these black showrunners, all these Latino showrunners. But if you look at the percentages, it's, it's still like less than 10 percent. There's still a huge inequality. And you look at network television in particular. Shonda left the network. She's Netflix. There's, and Kenya Barris left network. So who's there? You know, so it's like, well, we know we know Quinta. Quinta has the sweet deal, but she's doing she's doing all the multi hyphenates. She's getting a lot of checks. But um, Philip Augustine Jackson, who has a show after her, that's the only show he has, um, Grand Crew. So those are the only two Black showrunners I know of in network. But people who are doing stuff on Stars and Hulu and all these other you know, uh, streamers, they're not getting paid the same. And that, that's a shame. And it's, just, it's a shame that someone have to repeat doing the same job and not being able to rise up so they can make the good money and run shows because the, the number of showrunners of color is dismally low, just like the numbers in the guild. And this is what keeps it going like that, where you're keeping, and now they're keeping writers from actually producing their episode and being on set to really execute their vision. There's a fight about that right now. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, that's just some of it. The AI thing is a whole nother discussion. I'm not an expert, but I did post today about how they're basically essentially trying to hire one writer per show and have AI do the rest. And that's disturbing as well. So um, this came from a real article. Writer per show? Yeah. That would take the flavor out of the, yeah, the show. Yeah, it would eliminate the writer's room. And they've already created these mini writer's rooms, which like, for example, with Swarm, um, Janine Neighbors, who is one of the writers of that, who came from the show Atlanta, she finished up that show writing by herself, which is the most miniest writing one you can think of. So that's insanity. So you see these shows, and also you notice in streaming, there's like eight to 10 episodes, and network is like 22. So if, when you had 22 episodes, you could like do that and then maybe work another show if you wanted to. But now the way it's set up, writers have to go from show to show to show to show just to pay their bills because you, you do eight episodes that's made maybe 10 12 weeks and you're done then w- the rest of the year what are you doing and there's no guarantee you'll get another job and there might be 10 to 60 months before you get another job so it, it's a lot this i'm just giving you a little bit of piece but anyone who wants to know more you can go to uh, wga contract 2023 dot org and that's the writers guild website about the strike and get all the updates but we're really um optimistic because last week something that never happened in history happened where the writers guild the directors guild the the teamsters which is the locations um they all got under one roof in new york and in la and pledged solidarity and the dga talks are starting now that's the directors guild and the sag talks set screen actor guilds the actors that's about to start right so all of these talks are about to happen. And when I was at a Writers Guild meeting here in Atlanta last week, they said they're probably holding out to see how the others are going to fare before they you know, make any agreements. But it really, it really boils down to corporate greed. And when you see who runs these, these studios, they're all white men. That's just, I mean, that's what it is. And there, there is some white superiority in, in work at Hollywood that people don't talk about. But a lot of shows have been knocked off the air, like Gordita Chronicles, which was an HBO last summer, not even two months, it's yanked off the air. It was totally shot. There was a Latina Batgirl movie, totally shelved, totally made, $90 million, tax write-off. Now they're canceling overall deals, which are the big deals they give writers to develop many shows. They just canceled those a couple of days ago, including David Simon, who created The Wire and has been writing for 25 years. So there's just this like, it's like writers are disposable kind of mentality. And so we're not gonna pay them and, and we're not taking it anymore. And they, they, they have a bigger fight than they thought because 
they're really underestimating how this has affected people. And I think as the viewers get involved and understand it more, so that's what I'm trying to tell people who aren't in the industry, how important it is to let Netflix know. You don't, I mean, yeah, sure, cancel Netflix, but let them know the reason. Or, or write them a letter, email them, tweet them. Because if they hear from the consumers, that is going to mean something. If you, and if you shut down Netflix, that's the only streaming. Streaming is the only business they have. Paramount has Paramount Pictures. Disney has Hulu and the amusement parks. But if you shut down Netflix, streaming is the only thing they have. And because they set the standard, they're kind of like the target right now. But rightfully so. Ted Sarandos is like he doesn't have a conscience. And some of the quotes he's been saying lately are just, I don't even understand it. I don't even understand it. Wow. Uh, wow. I just, um, I'm taking in everything that you're saying. I yeah. hear so much. That is great. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, let me ask you, is it worth it to be in the WGA? Like, it, how is it uh, worth it for, for well, your- Well, um, I, haven't, I haven't gotten to the part where the healthcare and all that will kick in, but everyone I know who's in the guild, um, you know, you have good health care. You, um, you know, you have somebody fighting for your rights, essentially, because if we were all non-union writers, then when you're non-union, you get paid once and that's it. But if you have a show like in the Shonda Rhimes universe or Ryan Mur Murphy Mur universe or, you know, somebody like that, where the shows are going to go on at Law and Order, Dick Wolf, if you if, just imagine you write a Law and Order show and you see how those, sh you know, how you've seen one Law and Order uh, show. You've seen it a million times rerun. Every time that reruns, the writer, the director, all those people get paid. If you're non-union, you get paid once, and that's it. My first acting job on TV, I got three hundred dollars. That thing aired seven times or more. I would I would get calls even years after. So I that really made me aware of how non-union works. Because people call me, oh, I saw you on TV, but I only got paid three hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, and um, so that's why I'm, I. There's there's freedom in doing non-union because you can do anything. But when you're looking at the bigger picture and you're talking about your pension and what's going to take care of you when you're older, it's important to have those benefits and, and be able to take care of your family and take care of yourself. And right now, the way it's set up, um, it, it's been called a gig economy because if you had a writing job, you know, 10 years ago, you were set. You didn't have to worry about, you could do one show, like I said, and live your life the rest of the time, but it's not like that. You're going from show to show to show, if there's a show to go to. Did you know there's so many shows out there and, and there's but so many writers. So, you know, it's, it's really complicated, but it really boils down to corporate greed. In a nutshell, it's corporate greed. For- um, It's corporate the, America. I have yeah. to say this. Hollywood is corporate America. Do not be fooled. I was told that when I first came to LA, I didn't understand what the woman was saying. She's a veteran in the industry, still is. And I actually saw her when I was in LA in March. And I said, I remember you told me this and now I understand. So everything that's happening here is happening in corporations. It, you know, major companies have nothing to do with entertainment. It's the same mentality. Squeeze the worker. You know, Amazon, the warehouse is not trying to get unionized their their stuff. I'm in a right to work state here in Georgia. And as long as they as long as they can, they're gonna try to keep Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee and meet the Florida non-union states because then they don't have to pay people and they can get away with exploiting them. And that's what's happening in Hollywood. So for uh, my the high schoolers that I know are listening, and uh, you mentioned that uh, though you were told you would have to move to LA to learn about writers, but you became uh, a member of the union in Atlanta, right? So how else can a person join um, if not through uh, a television show? Are there other ways for um, a writer to join the union? Well, you, well usually you, you sell a script or you get staff on a show. That's how you get in the guild, um, traditionally. The new media thing has opened it up a little, just as if you act in a new media project that's a signatory, you can get into SAG. Like, I actually got SAG eligible because I was in a web series several years ago. But in terms, I didn't even know when I got this job that it was gonna uh, allow me to be in the guild. But like I said, it's different WGA East, different WGA West. Um, 
But what I want to say that's really um, encouraging is when I first came to LA, if you wanted to be a writer, you live in LA, they did not take you seriously. But now that things have expanded and there's the internet, you know, people can apply for things from all over. I have a friend who got in what was now the defunct HBO program when she lived here in Atlanta. And then she, that's how she got in the guild. And now she's staffed and now she's, you know, striking. So now it doesn't matter where you are, but you still want to get that experience. And, you know, you can read scripts. There's so many, like, you can go online and read scripts. That didn't exist before. You had to get a physical script to read. So I would say wherever you are, just start doing your research. Go on YouTube, read books, read scripts. Um, watch stuff on TV and really study how is the script done, like make notes, what happened in this scene, what happened in that scene. Find your favorite script and study it backwards and forwards. Um, if, if, you know, if you're led to, go to school, but if not, you can take some community classes. There's always classes to take, a lot of them are online. So when you do go to LA or get the opportunity to come to LA for a meeting, you're fully prepared. Now, living in LA does allow you a lot more networking experiences than probably anywhere else. So for networking, LA is number one, but you can, you know, but they have things in New York, they have things in other places. You know, there's a lot of filmmaking in Chicago, in Louisiana, in North Carolina. You don't have to be like limited to New York or LA. Like there's, it's everywhere, even in like Oregon, like places I never thought, even in Kentucky. Like you really, Texas, like it's like, you don't have to be in one place geographically, but if you're gonna go to LA, you really gotta have a plan because it's really expensive over there. And that's another reason that these writers have been really affected because the, the housing rates have gone up significantly. And they, even after they pay their dues and, and their agents and their managers, then they have the living expenses. And, you know, and then they have taking care of their families, taking care of themselves. So they're not left with much left. Like it's just, it's not, it's, it doesn't end up being a living way, but it once was. And uh, you mentioned a number of places where um, a person can be and doesn't have to necessarily be in the New York and the LA. And I also have to give a shout out to uh, the place that we met, which is Indianapolis, Indiana, Bloomington. Mm -hmm. um, if you're listening and, you know, wanting to connect with artists, you know, uh, there are places that we worked at the International Thespian Festival, um, which is catered to the high school students who are interested in uh, more so actors, but they offer so many uh, other uh, classes. And I sat in your class and I just thought it was a phenomenal class as far as teaching the fundamentals of how a script comes together. So we're going to uh, make sure in the show notes that uh, people are able to get to you if you offer a class. But sure. I highly recommend uh, your class for writing. It was great, great writing class. And we're going to transition to uh, the segment that allows us to get to know you as an individual outside okay. of work. I'm okay. just going to a, a few questions. Some of them are a rapid response and some may take a little time to answer, but nevertheless, it's a way for us to get to yo you as an individual. Are you ready for some questions? I'm ready. All right. Cats or dogs? Dogs. I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> okay. Window or aisle seat? I like, I like windows. I like to look out and see everything. Okay. What book would you give as a gift? I really, there, there are a few books I've given, um, The Power of Now, The Artist's Way, um, The Autobiography, Autobiography of Malcolm X, um, When I Finished Baby Girl, The Baby Girl Book. It'll be ready to be purchased. Yes, <laughs> Baby Girl Uncensored, which is, Baby Girl's me, if you didn't know that. Yes. Right, 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 right behind me, right there. The awesome, yes, that that nice baby girl I see right there in frame. We gotta, I we I can't wait to to read that book. So come on, hurry up and put it together so we can buy it. Okay, I, I um, need to do that since there's a writer's strike. I can write other things, and that's the other beauty of being a multi hyphenate and not being limited to just writing one thing. If one thing isn't happening, you can go to another. So I'm not acting. I'm writing. I'm producing. I'm directing. I'm helping somebody with their story. So. 
you know, but that's just me. Some people are not wired that way. But I always encourage an actor to know something about writing, know something about directing, or get somebody they know to do something, to create something for them. I've never waited on anyone to create a role for me. Yes, people. <laughs> so when I do other people's auditions, I'm, I have nothing, there's nothing really to it. I'm just like, okay, I'll do this. If I get cast, fine. If I don't, I got baby girl. I got good daughter. I got, it ain't no joke. I got all these other things that I work on. So it's like, I don't need it. it there's no like anxiety about it. So that's, that's, it gives me a certain comfort that I think other people may not have because they just, they just trying to get a role. They're just trying to get a role. But I've created, I played so many roles in both of these pieces that I've I played a, I played a bunch of roles. I've been I've been the star or whatever. And then as a teaching artist, I've had the the attention of the young people that I've taught. So I'm not I've never wanted to be famous anyway. But my my most famous year was when I was subbing in a middle school and would walk in the hallways and kids would call my name. I was like, oh, okay, now I know fame. I'm good. I- I'm really simple. Like I don't, I don't need all the bells and whistles. As long as I'm creating and I'm happy and I'm paying my bills, I'm at peace. That's the goal. We want to be at peace yes. as we. Yes. There's a lot of madness in this business, so that's really important. To so your self care, I can't say enough about it. I wish someone had really talked to me about that when I was a teen. Taking care of you, spending time with you, not on a phone not on a tv just you you in a book you in your breath you taking a walk just in nature like just it's really really important because i know teens especially are hand are dealing with a lot of stuff on a higher level than we did when we were there that age so taking care of yourself is number one Yes. Knowing yourself, loving yourself. It, and even if you don't know how, just start to try. It started for me, a piece of paper when I was in college. What do I love about myself? And I would just add to the list. And I kept it in the top drawer in my dresser. And whenever I felt bad, I'd look at that piece of paper. But I didn't start that journey until I was out of high school. I wish I had started it before then. Things might have been better for me. But, you know, we all know it's supposed to be. Yeah, we're all on our paths to becoming... Uh, better versions of ourselves. Always. Yes, yes. So uh, is there a favorite recipe that you like to cook? Um, I like, um, I don't really cook it. I always try to get people to do it for me. Um, goat cheese lasagna with turkey turkey meat. Yeah, okay. that, that's a favorite of mine. And I, I, anything with salmon, I love. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a foodie and I love Indian food. I don't know how to make it, but I love it. <laughs> Like especially the lamb, okay. Lamb, the basmati rice, and I like Mediterranean food. Like American food is just kind of boring. I, I just I like I like other other people's other cultures food much more. And let's say that you have uh, this nice evening and you're enjoying your Mediterranean food. Is there a movie that you cannot resist watching if it came on? I really liked um, there's a few movies, but Barry Jenkins' first film, Medicine for Melancholy, I love. I also love The Last Black Man in San Francisco. I love Blind Spotting. I like these little independent art house that most people haven't heard of. Um, you can count on me. I really liked. Um, I'm trying to think of like something from my childhood. Probably Flashdance. That was like my favorite. That's still my favorite movie. People ask me. I'm just kind of old school like that. But in, anything with just regular everyday characters, anything if it's set in New York, it's going to probably get me. Um, Raising Victor Vargas, which is about a teen boy who's trying to get with this girl in the summertime. And it takes place in, it's in New York. It's in a, in a Latino area. And I, I, that was just a really sweet movie. I remember seeing that at a film festival. And I saw it recently again, and I just really just, I love Coming of Age. You're going to get me Coming of Age. So Wonder Years is my favorite show. And my, my, my show, Baby Girl, based on my play, is a Coming of Age. So anything with the Coming of Age theme, that, especially if it has diversity. Because when, when we were growing up, there wasn't much diversity. Like, you know, Breakfast Club was great. There was, you know, it was all white. Um, 
And, but, you know, I love the heart of it and I can relate to it, but I'm glad now that we have more stories that are celebrating everybody. Everybody's coming of age. Wonderful. What makes you laugh the most? Man, um, I watch stand up comedy far too much on YouTube. Um, but when I'm on Instagram, Tony Baker, who was in the comedy show I produced in 2016 before he was a name, before the animal videos, he's always known for the animal videos. His videos and his creativity are just always inspiring to me. And I actually went to go see him perform when I was in LA a few months ago. And it was good to see him again. So he brings me joy. <laughs> he brings me joy when I've had tough times. Trevor Noah as well. And now that Trevor has walked off, um, I'm hoping Roy Wood Jr. is going to be the new host for The Daily Show. It's really, really funny. And at times, Saturday Night Live. But Saturday Night Live is kind of... When it hits, it hits. But sometimes... But I, I love comedy. Like, stand-up comedy just makes me laugh. I, I can't... I'm trying to think of something in particular. And that's always where I go to. Really well done stand-up comedy. Okay. So let's say that you're at a gathering and the DJ plays some theme song or some entrance song. What would that song be to say, Capri has arrived? What's that song? Um, I would say um, Alicia Keys, This Girl's on Fire is, is definitely, definitely my main theme song, um, as well as Going Back to Fame. <laughs> Um, I'm going to make it happen, you know, all that um, flash dance. You know, first when there's nothing but a slow glowing dream. Uh, that is just, when Irene Carr passed away, I was so hurt. So hurt. But yeah, that, that, that song, that album, that movie, well, I think I didn't even, I, don't think, I did know I wanted, I think I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I hadn't really articulated it. I think I wrote something like I want to be a movie star, but I was just like writing something because my friend wrote it or something. But um, just the, the, the story of Alex and how she perseveres in that movie and at the end gets her, literally gets her flowers. It's just, it's a great film. Like, it, you know, it's hokey and it's the 80s, but if you guys haven't seen it, do yourself a favor. It is rated R, but, um, you know, I know y'all watch stuff radar anyway. So it's it's not it's not nearly as bad as some of the stuff today. So Right. Today's rated R is a whole diff different category of rated yes. R. Yes. <laughs> sure. If you could offer uh, a piece of advice to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps, whether becoming an actor, or producer, or a member of the Writers Guild, what advice would you give that artist? Keep your eye on the prize. Do not let anything deter you from what you believe that you are meant to do on this planet. And I really am a believer in being an artist to make the world a better place, to uplift people, to enlighten. So make sure your heart is in the right place. I don't, I don't think being an artist or saying, oh, I want to be an actor, I want to be a writer with a notoriety. I don't, I don't think that's putting it in the right place. I think you should be doing it for a purpose. So being purpose driven in your pursuits and knowing it's not going to be easy. There'll be a lot of deterrent. It could be racism. It could be sexism. It could be ableism. It could be all the ism. Um, I, I know I've, I've encountered um, many trans students in working at these thespian festivals and nothing can keep you from telling your story, whether you're acting, some, you're acting even when you're acting in someone else's script, you're still bringing your story to it. So stay true to your story, stay true to your vision, and just manifest the hell out of what God has put into you or whatever you believe in, you know, equal opportunity here. Um, just, you know, keep your eye on that prize and don't let anything or anybody stop you. And know there's no timeline. That's really important because life happens. Like with Baby Girl, Baby Girl's been in development since I was in college. But it wasn't the right time. And sometimes I, I, it was too hard for me to write because it was some painful stuff that I just couldn't deal with. But one day came and the story kept knocking me on the shoulder, said, you got you to gotta finish me, you got to finish me. When I finally presented it the way I'd always imagined it, the timing was perfect. Because when, when it first came to me, it was, um, 
I had all these sound cues and there was no YouTube. It would have been really expensive to get those sound cues. I wrote a multimedia piece before multimedia theater existed. So sometimes you are ahead of what's in the world. So you might have to wait. So really understand there's no timeline. That's so important because we can beat ourselves up. Oh, well, my story is five years old and my story has been 10 years old. It doesn't matter. Your story is still there and your life isn't over. So you have time. So give yourself grace in that because it's hard being an artist. And a lot of people do not understand it and do not respect it, as we can see with this writer's guild strike. So persevere anyway. Mm. Do it. Just do it. Like, like Nike, just do it. Yes, I love that. Persevere anyway, people. Uh, and some final thoughts. Um, what projects are you looking forward to? It's coming up. Like these are some exciting things that are happening, even though that there is a strike and you remember WGA, but is there something that you're looking forward to working on or creating? Uh, yeah. Um, well, when, when Baby Girl, the pilot is on the air, um, that's always been something I've been looking forward to. I'm also going to do a podcast and limited series on Baby Girl's sequel, The Good Daughter, which is behind me. Um, and that is my caregiving journey with my mother. And that's a story that has um, touched a lot of people as a play. So I, I want to spread that message. Um, and anything I tell is bigger than me. When I see the impact it makes in my audience, it inspires me. And I'm also planning to have both Baby Girl and Good Daughter staged on both posts, but I will not be acting in them. And to get get some a name attachment to, to spread the story even further. Um, and then I also have a caregiver book um, for the you know, present day generation as well as my generation. Because I find that I found that a lot of the caregiver books weren't speaking to me directly and they weren't speaking to my friends. And I became the first caregiver of all my friends. So um, that is definitely uh, something I'm looking forward to. And then I have a hip hop love story right in time for hip hop's 50th anniversary, a feature, because um, Brown Sugar was one story, but I have another one. So, um, that I'm really, really looking forward to. I had a reading last year that got good reception and uh, I just got to do my rewrite. Yes, a list of projects that are coming up for you and I can't wait to see yeah. them all. I'm going to be there. Uh, my final two questions before we uh, have to end this show, would you like to give some shout outs to some, uh, some supportive individuals or those you know who have helped you along the way? You, you have to recognize them. Well, I've already spoke a lot and I didn't say her name, Dorothy, my mother. Um, I will always shout her out. Um, my father in his own way, uh, Chester. My brother, Lee, who um, sparked the artist in me. And my Aunt Catherine, who I didn't mention, um, is my other na namesake, my mother's sister, who was the only artist I knew of in my family growing up. She started painting at the age of 50. I still have some of her art to this day, including the teddy bear she made me as a baby. So. Um, that they are definitely in my immediate family. Um, my teachers, Miss um, Morris George, uh, who's my seventh grade creative writing teacher, Miss um, Barron, who's a creative writing teacher. I don't. I hope she's still around. I was able to give her her flowers in person a couple years ago. Um, and in college, um, Kelsey Colley, who was my playwriting professor, who said, "Yeah, you can tell your story." And Vera Katz, who supported me no matter what I did. Um, and then I just have lots and lots of friends that are like friend, uh, family. There's too many to name, but the, um, I'll highlight the two Chris's at Ivory. <laughs> they know who they, they all know who they are. Um, they've been really, you know, a lot of my Howard family, a lot of my New York family, LA family, my friend Tanae in Houston, my longtime friend, uh, my childhood friend, Renisha in Kaya, California, and my long, 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 my oldest friend, next to her, Candy, who even though she moved when we were in high school, we stayed in touch. And this is before all the technology and she's in, in Florida. And I've always been very grateful for her support of me. And uh, I, I have many friends from the different places I've lived and worked. And I'm just, I'm grateful to everybody. And I must also shout out Mama D, who's like a mother to me in North Carolina when I was a teaching artist there. She's inspirational to me because she was, uh, working in the jail, so when she saw the kids coming in young, she decided to go to school and become a teacher and make an impact, which she has done. And uh, she's always been a cheerleader for me as well. 
and of course my aunt Priscilla. And then my mother had two friends that were very supportive of me. One who just passed away, Muriel, and um, and uh, Melva who passed away during COVID. Um, and you no, know, yeah. So I have a lot of voices in my head of people who support me, um, whether they're here or not. So whether they're ancestral or their phone call or email or text away, I'm very grateful for for those people very much so. And last question, how can people follow you, connect with you on social media? I mean, you have, like I said, her spirit writing class is it. I enjoy it myself. So how can people, you know, follow you and reach out to you? Uh, well, the main the main way is Instagram. So I consider myself a prism with many sides. So it's K prism, K-A-Y prism. And um, my, my website's kpre.com. I'm not on Twitter because I was raised by activists. So, but it would be Kprism on, on Twitter if so it's not active, but it's on there. Um, I'm liking some of the strike stuff, but other than that, not really. Um, my email is bookbabygirl at gmail.com if you're interested in some consultant or have a question. Um, and I'm also started um, a series of seminars um, that's um, I'm going to be doing um, on, I did my first one actually this weekend on line producing with my best friend, which is the person that handles all the money and budgeting and film, because we, again, it's a place where there's not any inclusiveness. It's mostly white males. So everybody needs to have a shot at that job. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be doing, um, I've, I've been teaching the playwriting to screenwriting and, um, but I was thinking maybe I should do like an intro to screenwriting or even the adapt the adaptation thing because adapting one literary genre to another, I've been doing it for so long that I want to pass on some of the tricks that I've come up with. So, yeah, just about everything. I mean, I I do acting coaching as well, but I just haven't formally hung a shingle. But pretty pretty much anything with performing and writing, um, and you know, if someone's doing a book, if someone's doing a press release, if someone's doing a biography, like bio, like. Anything with writing and words is my specialty. So um, I enjoy helping people tell their stories, especially if they're not sure how to go about. They can just tell me some things and I'm like, oh, you should do this, 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 this. And they're like, oh, you know, so that's, yeah, I'm, I'm online. <laughs> I'm a prison. I, um, I heard a quote, I think that that goes with you that says, uh, to do what others find difficult is talent. Mm -hmm. And to but talent finds difficult is genius. And like I said, when I met her and getting to know her, she really is on a genius level. She is a multi-hyphenate. And I encourage uh, everyone listening to please connect with her on social media. And when she posts that, hey, I'm doing this class, get in. Because I learned some things and I thought with myself, like, I know a little something. I said it like, oh, okay, that's good. She out here teaching. So... <laughs> Please connect with her. But we've come to the end of today's spotlight. Uh, if this podcast has helped you, please share. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Dream of Drea across all social media platforms. I am Drea of Dream of Drea, a production company specializing in driving your ideas from pages to stages and from your dreams to screens. Remember, wherever you are right now is the perfect time to act on your dreams. Again, thank you to Capri to uh not pre k pre i'm thinking about the drink because i'm thirsty but uh <laughs> thank you for joining us and uh we look forward to uh connecting next time see you uh later everybody take care thank you <laughs>